Big welcome to our two guests who are here today, um, both John Savage from Camp Centennial in New Brunswick and Lori, who is here from Toad Sports. Um, we're going to first turn things over to Lori, who she and I connected up, I want to say, was it January, February already? She reached out to me about just saying, hey, do you think this would be something useful to camps? And I said, heck yes, I think it would be definitely. So we're able to use this time um, to have her just do a short promo slash infomercial about how she can help camps um, with her toad sports information. So Lori, I'm going to turn it over to you and then we'll go to John. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Appreciate that. And um, yeah, well, I'm very grateful for this opportunity and I will be very quick and brief. And if if anybody wants to talk about this further after, please feel free to uh, reach out. And um, I, Kim has my contact information, but we can certainly connect uh, in any way. Uh, following that. So just to give you a quick overview, what what this is, is what we're trying to do is be an advocate here or a, a support group for Toad Water Sports in, in Manitoba and surrounding Ontario. And and what, what existed before is a boat driver's course uh, as part of the coaching program only has now been split out and it is its own entity. And so we have taken what Water Ski Weight Board Canada has um, put together, defined it to be a little more like what we can use here in our province. And what we'd like to do is bring that to uh, camps that offer water sports to make sure that you have the people in place that can do this safely and knowledgeably. And, you know, we understand their staff turnover, but this, this program, um, it, it, it will give you, I want to say certification. It will, uh, it, it falls under the coaching um, concept of the NCCP program. So what we've been finding too is that insurance and risk management and liability have become first and foremost when, it, uh, um, when we're trying to get insurance. And so these types of programmings um, or programs are, we find will help in, it's been helping us and in Ontario right now, more so uh, Toronto way, they've had huge issues with the lakes and the camps and all this wakeboarding and boating that they do out there. And, and this has just been one positive step to try and encourage boat owners and boat users and camps to have the proper tools in place um, to deliver a good program. And it doesn't affect how they get their permits and things like that. So I'm just gonna quickly share something really quick here with you guys, uh, just to give you um, an overview of, of what it is where, or, looking to do here. Sorry. So what we've done is we've taken, as I noted, the course from uh, Water Ski Weightboard Canada, and we've aimed it to, to boat drivers in particular, in the general sense. So the goals of this course is what we want to do is expose drivers to the concept that driving a boat for pleasure versus towing is completely different. Um, we want to ensure that the participants um, and the drivers uh, are aware of all the safety aspects of driving and towing well on the water. Not everybody knows uh, the proper etiquette out there, let's call it. This course will offer some experience, some hands-on experience. And of course, like everything, we just want to have some fun with it. So um, course overview, there is some resource materials, classroom, doc side is how we're proposing to deliver this. Uh, so it'd be a verbal scenario. Again, we would provide you with the resources in the printed format ahead of time. So just some things we would go over is the proper communication skills, a basic start, picking up a fallen skier, the driving patterns on a lake when you're towing somebody, um, equipment related uh, equipment issues or just general knowledge. So attaching ropes or anything like that and then proper docking um, techniques. And again, this is just a quick overview. There are about four sections to the resources that sort of highlight some of these areas. So again, you may have a lot of these things in place already but um, doesn't hurt to be well-educated, I guess. So what we're hoping this will look like, because we have not delivered this in the past, um, in this kind of setup, is we would like to come to you. So we would either host a clinic at a central location, a camp, or go, go directly to your camp if everybody wants them independently, that is fine too, but we could host a 
a half day, full day session at, at a central location where your people could come there. There would be no cost to your organizations at all. This would all be uh, funded through Water Ski Wakeboard Manitoba. And again, as I sort of touched on before, it is recognized as certification under the NCCP model. So anybody who might be um, advancing their coaching, this is something that can be uh, used. And what we're finding too is the risk management and the insurance qualifiers, um, these types of, of check boxes, if you will, have been very beneficial for us to um, meet the needs of insurance providers. So. Honestly, that's all I really wanted to get it out there today um, and encourage some conversation. If anybody is interested or wants more information or interested in setting something up, uh, my email address is there and that's my cell phone currently. We're not out of the offices right now, but um, yeah, it, 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 it's, we're excited by it. We like the fact that it's separated from the coaching because it's not teaching slalom trick and jump driving it's just teaching um safe boating and that part we like so we're hoping to be also then offering these clinics in the city of winnipeg brandon area um out east if we need to just for the general public as well i'm hoping to partner with uh red cross society and the marine dealers association as well so whenever a new boat owner comes along or somebody purchases a boat we can promote this program with them and, and get everybody who's using a boat out there uh, a better driver so that really is it um happy to answer any questions if you have any uh or please uh feel free to reach out separately and and i can answer anything you might have or look towards looking for. awesome thank you so much Lori. and i know just as an advocate of that too i know that some people can get their voting license by just uh, doing it online, right? You've got your mm -hmm. boat operator's card, but that doesn't mean you know all those ins and outs and depending how much a camp will train their staff, this is just a really good idea, I think, in order to get your staff trained properly, right? Maybe you think you know and you don't really know for sure. Um, yeah. So I think great option for sure. And especially that price tag free yeah. um, is a good thing too. Any questions for Lori? Uh, Lori, just a, the, you may have covered this earlier. I'm sorry, I missed the very front, but um, are you looking to travel to us? Like if you were to host one in Kenora, would we need to pay for the travel expense or anything like that? Because we there are a number of camps out in the Kenora area that uh, does quite a bit of boating. And um, we're all required to do like a number of different boating certifications, depending on the types of boats we have. But uh, th this would be super interesting for at least our camp. Uh, we're Manitoba Pioneer Camp located in Ontario. Uh, so, No, I mean, that's sort of what Kim and I had that conversation that we would be happy to come to you. That's what, how we're trying to deliver it now is we'll okay. come to you because it's your people, your boat. Like there's no point in you coming into the city, let's say, or another um, opposite end of the world for you. So the idea would be we'd try and come to you or create a central location that this, you know, everybody could travel to that wouldn't be too inconvenient. Um, but yeah, that, that, those are conversations we're happy to have. And, awesome. and yeah, that's not a problem. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? All right. Well, Lori's information is there as well. And I want to thank you, Lori, so much for joining us. It was good to have you here and to get that conversation started um, about what you're offering. So thank, thank you. you. We'll be in touch. Thanks, Kim. Take care, everybody. Nice to meet you all. Bye. Bye. Okay, I'm going to switch gears here now then too. And um, want to introduce you John Savage. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting John, like, I think it was the fall of 2018 when I was at a a course way out in Alberta, not Alberta, BC. Sorry, we were right in the coast, the Sunshine Coast. And funny story to go along with that is that um, all the communication we had with registration was for the International Camp Directors course um, was through John Savage. And he was continually responding, super good communicator. Like you'd email or text him something and you would hear back from him in less than a minute, I think, even if it was like a mile long email, it was fabulous. And as we got to the ferry, we were going across to the island. Um, there was this guy there who was doing all the communication. Everybody come here. I'm going to buy the tickets for you. All the stuff we were doing. And we're like, oh, cool. That's John. He's such a nice guy. Blah, blah, blah. 
And I think it was like maybe later on that day, um, or even it was until the next day that we had this conversation with a guy who we all thought was John Savage. And it was actually his assistant director from camp in New Brunswick who was there with him. But John had kind of put the pieces together, made all the communication, passed it off to Vince to take care of. And then he was on vacation for a little bit. He wasn't even at this course. So here we all think Vince is John and we're talking with him and thinking it's John. And I think if I recall correctly, John, Vince even called you or something says, John, they all think that I'm you. And you're like, just go with it, just go with it. So we were, we were having this personality issue. Caroline, I think you were there then too. I'm just remembering that as well, that it was a pretty funny, pretty funny time not knowing who actually is John Savage. Um, but he took care of us. Uh, last fall, I was happy to be able to um, take part in a presentation that he did about what their camps in New Brunswick did overnight, because it was a big deal when no one else in Canada could do overnight camping. And I asked him to join us here today, um, then to do that presentation to just help you all out for whatever's coming up going forward. So um, I'm going to turn it over to you, John. He is the director at New Brunswick Camp Centennial, and he will take it over from here and share things. So go for it. Thanks so much, John, for being here. Thanks, Kim. And yeah, at that point, that was a story about like, you know, the chaos of camp and who knows what could happen. And then, you know, a year or two later, it really just shifts gears up of just how much things can really go awry. So um, yeah, as Kim mentioned, uh, Camp Centennial was uniquely fortunate to run in 2020. Um, and we ran almost, I'll say very similar to our regular programs in a lot of ways. So I do have a presentation put together, happy to show you guys. Uh, but as you can imagine, in any summer, specifically maybe even last summer, um, there's a lot of avenues that we can go and chat about things. So I know this is a common invitation on Zoom meetings, but if anyone wants to speak up and focus on something, um, if Manitoba is in a specific position that there's something being talked about, I'm happy to comment or change directions. Um, and if you're not comfortable speaking up, you're welcome to use the chat. I'll keep an eye on it and I'm uh, willing to go in whatever direction is, is useful for you folks. Um, so I'll start the presentation here. Um, can someone pipe up and let me know if you see right now? Uh, nope, that's not it. You betcha. You okay. are on there. You betcha. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so a quick background here. Um, Why don't you just turn yours off? My sound is pretty good still. Um, so Camp Centennial is a privately owned, what we call a blended program, uh, meaning that we have both day camps and overnight components to our camps. Um, in 2019, as a gauge, we had roughly 1,600 camper weeks um, in that blended program. We've been operating for about 30 years. Our overnights are anywhere from one to four nights. So Monday to Friday being the longest. Um, we actually have three sites, but really two sites for camps. We have a main campus here for our day camps. And then we have an overnight site, um, about 400 acres in more central area of New Brunswick. Um, and that's actually relatively new to us. So it's something we're developing. And up until COVID, it was largely a growth program. It's where we were, um, I'll say our program was heading. <laughs> Um, sorry about that. Um, and then, excuse me for one second, sorry. Hey, hey. Sorry. Um, so about 32 staff, um, and our registration process normally opens November 1st. Um, we also do school spring programs um, that are just day only really for the most part. And we also have year round facility and catering services um, out of all of our facilities. So that's kind of the snapshot of who we are and how we've operated in the past. Um, and this presentation specifically is a bit of that story of 2020. Um, some of the lessons, the practical lessons that we went through as well as some of the bigger, like maybe um, philosophical or even maybe emotional lessons that went along the way. Um, but again, if there's anything you guys are specifically looking for, happy to chat about that too. Um, so please just let me know. 
if we rewind about a year, um, so it, into, into 2020, uh, where we were in early March at that time, where our registrations were about 50%, we do collect revenue, our deposits at time of registration, our hiring, our returning staff had all been hired, but our new staff, about 12 spots, we were starting interviews, but hadn't yet hired. Um, our spring school programs were all full and our catering rentals were on par. So it was, I'll say, a normal, a normal time up until early March. As you guys may or may not remember, those first couple of weeks of March is when things really start to hit the fan. So um, it was during interviews, really, when we first recognized an impact on COVID. We had these students going away to Europe that were going to come back and do interviews with us. And at that time, there were some European countries that were hit before North America was. So it was still an abstract conversation in a lot of ways. You know, it really didn't feel real at this point. And um, New Brunswick, uh, our education minister reacted a little quicker than most and actually told students coming back from Europe trips that they weren't able to go back to school. And at the time, that was seemed crazy. You know, he was being wildly overreactive. Um, hindsight being 2020, it worked out well for us. But um, in those first little while, by March 10th, um, everything shut in New Brunswick. So our catering and rentals were totally canceled, um, anything that was operating at that time. And we recognized at that point that this was big. This was obviously we were all on that learning curve, but got there pretty quick. And so some decisions we needed to make were, you know, do we hire the new staff? When do we contact the parents we already have registered? Do we allow more registrations? Um, and obviously some of those questions like, you know, how long will this last? All those things, as you guys remember, and are still probably asking yourselves, um, they, were, they were new topics at the time. For us, it was an interesting, when I look back on this and actually when I made this presentation in the fall for Kim's group, um, it was interesting to reflect on some of the things we had to realize. And one of the ones is if, if we don't run camp, we weren't certain of our existence. Um, we're a private organization. We're a small organization in the sense that we don't have any parent funding company, and we also don't do any fundraising. We operate as what we call a social enterprise. So any of our business funnels into our programs, um, which allowed for a lot of flexibility, but also meant that um, you know, we were up against the wall in certain ways. We're also at that time in the middle of investing in a new site um, and building it into another camp. So you know, this, this shift had multiple ramifications as it would for any organization. We recognize that we had no control over the situation. Uh, we have no way of determining the direction or outcomes at that point. Um, and the reason I mention that is that in the months of March and April, um, as society often does, people reacted in different ways. And I think when we realize that we have no control, sometimes we try and find control. And we did see in early March or late March, and early April, some organizations starting to cancel things for summer. Um, you know, the YMCA Canada was one of the first, I think, that kind of came out and, and, and talked about the cautionary tale of summer 2020. Um, and at this point, that was a, a reaction some organizations were doing. We also realized that we needed a rubric to make decisions and thinking both for the well being of camp as well as for ourselves, because so much of Camp Centennial's approach to things is maybe overthought out, which I don't think is totally unique. I think it's in a lot of camps that, you know, we have so much feeling, so much passion towards what we do. Um, and so the tradition of even how we contact parents, why we contact parents, how we use our social media, all of those things we started to realize like we might need to shift our approach, but we didn't know how. Um, so the first really like surprising conversation that we had to get over was the idea that we may not exist in 2020 by the end of 2020. And truthfully, the reason I mention this is that once we came to terms with the possibility that, or the possibility that our doors may shut and never open and realizing that that wasn't some failure of ours, that this is a global pandemic and that it was out of our control, it really helped us come up with decision-making models that I think were healthier for ourselves and for the program in the long run. Um, any comments on any of that, questions, things that are surprising? I'm going really fast and I don't actually know how much time I have. So I assume someone's gonna shut me up at some point, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> just keep going, silence is good. You have lots of time, keep going. <laughs> um, so a few decisions that we made right off the bat. Um, I guess I've touched on a little bit about this, but um, 
the closures, we decided we weren't going to make any decisions until we had information. So we didn't want, we decided not to be preemptive in that sense. Um, we also decided not to extend information until our camp, to our camp families until we had information to give. So we chose not to reach out at this time. Um, we also recognize that people were in need at that moment. You know, people were losing jobs. There wasn't the support of CERB and all these things at this time. It was early days. And so we did increase our social media presence to try and help with some of the um, like stay at home order type stuff. But honestly, really didn't have any success with it. We weren't any good at it. We'd never done it before. Um, we did start having a lot of routine conversations with our staff, touching base with them much more often, um, almost weekly or bi-weekly to try and, and um, like almost a mental health approach more than anything, just being connected. Um, and we also recognize that no amount of delay or withholding refunds was gonna save us if our doors closed permanently. And so that was one of the decisions we made was that anyone that asked us for a refund at that time, even though our deposits were normally non-refundable, we just gave it to them. It was that realization that, um, again, what is in our control compared to not. Excuse me again, sorry. Hi, I'm just in the middle of a presentation. I can't chat. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry again. <laughs> um, and so we decided to keep our staff on full time as well, recognizing that at least for the short term, before all these wage subsidies and around came around, that we were all in it together. We were going to need everybody if we were going to succeed. And if bad things happened, then letting go of our staff at that time wasn't going to help us. So that's kind of where we were. And we started to decide to plan, plan for things without knowing what the outcome would be. And we came up with dozens of unlikely outcome plans. Some of those plans were fundraising options. You know, we'd never done it before, recognizing that there would be a huge learning curve for us. We started to have those conversations. What would that look like? What were the possibilities? Um, one of the things we talked about was an early start. What if schools didn't open, but COVID relaxed? Would we be able to run early? Um, what if we did a complete shift and become a community support program for other activities? Um, what if there was a cure and all of a sudden everything was perfect, which has still not happened. But um, these were the kind of things that largely for our personal benefit, a group of people, as you all are, that work at camps that are largely busy bodies. When we were stuck at home, we were having problems of just like what we do with our days. So we decided to come up with these contingency plans. Fast forwarding a little bit to May, um, one of the plans that we had no belief to be relevant um, was ended up occurring. We had an announcement from the provincial government that New Brunswick was gonna start the reopening process. And they were the first province in Canada to start doing that because our case counts were so low. Um, and what they recognized was that daycares were gonna open first. They were gonna allow two weeks of daycares opening before anyone else, restaurants, retail, anybody, because they needed people, kids to go to somewhere so their parents could start to work. One notable mention is that day camps were explicitly mentioned in this announcement. And I've been deeply involved in the New Brunswick Camping Association and the Canadian Camping Association. We have no formal relationship with the province, provincial government. This was not a like well-planned, dictated approach. It was, we were blindsided by it. But what we heard rumor of was that the provincial government realized that they had a problem. There wasn't enough daycare spots to get everyone back because people were expecting, you know, normally you rely on schools. So they thought, hmm, maybe daycares or day camps can be an avenue to alleviate some of that pressure. It's also, you know, I know in some ways it's the same situation now as it was a year ago, but in some ways it's completely different. The attitude and atmosphere at this time is that no one knew what was gonna happen when we reopened. And there was so much uncertainty still around the disease and condition. And I know that there still is, but it really was a, a different mindset, at least for us. Um, and so when they released this announcement, they also said that there'd be protocols for daycares and day camps to run. So specifically how we were to do it. Um, and when we looked, took a look at these protocols, we realized that we were in a position that we could offer our program. And it's what we called pre-camp camp. And we would decided we'd give ourselves two weeks from the announcement to get prepared. And we would run for four extra weeks. 
That meant we'd be welcoming roughly 57 campers per week, and we'd be only using returning staff. So anyone that was working at it would have worked at camp for anywhere from two to five years already, meaning that by and large, they had all the certifications they needed and, and those kind of things. We had to develop an operational plan at a time where that was a term no one knew what that meant, ourselves included. Um, and some of the like specific details of the um, regulations that the province put out was that the screening of every camper every morning by a non-contact thermometer, the screening of every camper um, with a contact thermometer happened later, <laughs> um daycare inspector sorry i'm mixing this up these are some of the things that happened during pre-camp camp um and so these are some of the things we handled was the change of screening campers from non-contact to contact uh, we had an incident with a daycare inspector who announced to the city of moncton that any kid who went to day camp then had to quarantine for two weeks which was just something that person made up, but told everybody. Um, there was also the Child Care Act was misquoted and stated that day camps weren't allowed to run outside of the summer months. Um, and so this is all happening while we have kids at camp. <laughs> um, and then sleeping arrangement protocols came in the week before our normal camp was supposed to run. In those four weeks of pre-camp, the province updated the protocols for running seven times. Four of those seven times, they had protocols that would have closed our doors. <laughs> but in all of that, we got lucky in the sense that uh, we created a relationship with a, a person of the health authority that ended up really being wonderful and, 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 and helped us create these protocols that worked for everybody. Um, I kind of was confusing on that slide. Is there any questions about what's going on there? <laughs> Anyone want to speak? Is there anything in the chat? I can't actually see the chat when I'm on slideshow. Cool. So there's no nope, one. Nothing in the no chat yet. At all. Perfect. I'll just keep going. Um, so I'll quickly mention what camp looked like as far as our protocols compared to normal. One of the things that Camp Centennial operates on uh, from a staffing perspective in every year is that we try and train our staff in everything that we do. So we don't have program specific staff. What that means is that when our counselors are associated to a camper group, let's say me and Kim are associated to our seven, eight year old boys. When we go to offer something like canoeing or um, the wall, we are certified to offer those programs. So we actually go with our kids to that program and run it as we see fit. What that meant for COVID was that the protocols required that campers within a bubble of 15 kids didn't need to wear a mask and didn't need to socially distance. But those 15 kids could not interact in any way with any other kids or counselors. And so for the method that we were already running camp, that was okay because we didn't have program specific staff that had to come in and operate certain things. Now in pre-camp, there were things we weren't allowed to do, like we weren't allowed to use the wall, um, but those, those protocols changed over the summer as well. And so, as kids came in for the day camp portion, which is what pre-camp was, um, they came in and there were screening processes and questions we had to ask. And there's all kinds of logistics for drop off that were unbelievable to think of, of, of coming up with, but eventually became routine. As we head into normal camp, um, we had this overnight component and now obviously things like food services and sanitizing and all these things that had to happen on top of our normal program. Um, and so to give you an idea of how that happened, um, we capped our registrations at about 70% of our normal capacity, but we had over 100% of our staff, so our normal staffing. And so the only way we were able to adapt the way we did, not because the protocols were so challenging, but because there was just so much more to do was by having added staff. Um, and then any staff not directly related with the camper group had to be socially distanced. Um, and then as the summer went on, masks started to become a thing as well. And that, that all kind of changed. Um, some of the things that were, I'll say challenges that we, we had to figure out. Um, one was the screening process. How do we get 150 kids a day screened without it lasting hours? 
Um, our counselor interactions were really interesting. The staff were great. They came in the gate and they did exactly what they're told. They rose to the occasion. They were excited to be at camp. You know, everything there was great. But we also knew in New Brunswick at the time, there was no cases of COVID. The confidence was so high, I'll say bordering on arrogance in this province, and still is, um, that the counselors would be, you know, distanced and sanitizing and doing all these things. And they'd walk out our gate and then they'd be hanging out without a mask, doing whatever they want. And that's what everyone in the province was doing. But it was really interesting from a, like I'll say, a, a management perspective to know that those things are happening. And what do you do about it? What right do you have to tell these employees what they're doing at home? Especially when I'll say that was the norm in the province, really. Um, so that was a challenge. There was counselor certifications, organizations like Paddle Canada, uh, the Life Saving Society. These organizations had been shuttered since March and weren't up and running yet because New Brunswick started first. And all of these places, surprisingly, don't look at New Brunswick as leaders, as no one ever does. So um, that was a challenge. And we were lucky enough to have enough instructors in-house on these things that like we offered online versions and only in person for the components we had to, again, really leaned on our community to be able to get what we needed to. And being completely honest, we relied heavily on the fact that we had returning staff and we weren't, we were also, we were pausing that counselor development. So this year we noted like we have a huge amount of training required because so many of our staff are not experienced in the certifications that we needed. Food services was another like really fear-based decision-making. Like, you know, we were just so scared to be doing it and not knowing how to do it. Um, we moved a large portion of our food services actually to this like group method. So campers were cooking their own food um, because it allowed for social distancing requirements not to happen. And then basically they would take all of their supplies that they used and we would sanitize it through our normal like dishwashing protocols. So they were, they were handling the cooking and we were handling the cleaning kind of thing. Um, and then there was the overall sanitizing and equipment use, which again, nothing we ever would have thought of, but things as simple as soccer balls to hula hoops to, you know, how do we orchestrate um, groups using this stuff when they're not allowed to touch it one after another. And so for Camp Centennial, we came up with, you know, four classifications of equipment and they were sorted and sanitized in different ways. And we, um, the staff had to learn this etiquette so that they knew how to use our equipment basically. Um, I do have, and could go into if you want to, I have the policies and procedures that the province required us to follow. I would guess that at this point, these are things that you guys have seen versions of, if not New Brunswick's, you've seen like proposed versions from other provinces. So that stuff I'm assuming isn't super interesting or relevant specifically for Manitoba anymore. Um, I also have Camp Centennial's operational document online at Camp Centennial. Last time I did this presentation, I went through it kind of quickly, but I'm thinking that if you guys want to see it, you're just welcome to go look and, and, and again, at any time can reach out. I'm happy to, to chat about them. Does anyone have any difference of opinion on that? Anything they really want to see? Cool. I'll just keep going because you guys are super quiet. <laughs> um, so some things that came of those experiences. One, we got in this uniquely fortunate position that we had a relationship with someone at the health authority. And it was a really good person in the sense that it was the individual that was deputized to spearhead the camp programs. They were non-political. This was not normally their job. So they didn't fit into the hierarchy that's normally there in that type of organization, which meant they were able to make decisions based on information, which is a nice change of process <laughs> um, as to the, what we sometimes see. And it was like, she really was phenomenal. And she is the reason New Brunswick had the success it did in camps in the sense that she was strictly following health protocols to make sure that we were, I'll say operating as safe as, as one could assume possible during a COVID type situation, but also was listening to like, okay, well, some of these procedures just can't work that way. Like that's just not how camps work. So she was really open-minded to that. Um, one of the messages that is really important that I think everyone hears 
is that it was really hard. It was a really hard summer. And even now, I'm only recognizing some of the impacts like personally, emotionally, as an organization, as a province that it had. It was tough, but it was doable. And if you believed in camping in 2019, if you were in this industry for a reason, which I, I just believe everyone here is, no one does it for any other reason, then those reasons are only that much more important this year. If we believed in connection and learning and outdoors and experiences, our young people are missing that more than they ever have. And so I think it's completely okay to look at the situation and say, this is not something I want to do this summer, but it's important to hear that it's doable. It's possible. The resources are out there. Um, there's some camps that have experienced it and most of them are really happy to help. So uh, I strongly encourage you as you're going through this process to hear that it is tough and you've got to take care of yourself, um, but it is doable. And with that kind of same message in mind, staff well-being was something that we at Camp Centennial obviously was always aware of, but we never experienced widespread mental health um, implications, I'll say. And just like, I'll say even things like grouchiness, we never saw that here with our staff but it was widespread, you know, just people were edgy. They'd been in their houses and, 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 and you know, that, that impact can only be larger this year than it was last. So um, that staff well-being piece, I think is something that if it was a little bit on your radar in past years, I strongly encourage you to try and think of it proactively this year. Um, those wonderful people that you have working for you are still wonderful, but they've maybe got new challenges. Um, and it was the foundation of our staff that really allowed us uh, to reach out with this uncertainty at that time, um, that existing staff, our financial position, and the infrastructure that we had already in place. If we didn't have those things, um, the uncertainty of COVID would have made it that we couldn't run. And not every organization is as, as blessed or as lucky as we are, and that's okay. You know, If you don't have a lot of returning staff, or if you're not in a financial position, like when we ran last summer, the idea wasn't to be profitable. It wasn't even to make, to break even at that season. It was that some revenue was required and that was why we did it, part of why we did it. Um, any questions on any of that? Um, I have a quick question. Yeah. Just great. in regards to, um, you had mentioned that reflecting back on last year that it was like really, really hard. Yeah. Um, what are some things now going into this year that you would do differently if regulations were kind of the same as they were last year now having that time to reflect on that? So. From a like personnel perspective, I think what weighed on everyone here was uncertainty. Um, but also because I'll say me specifically, my role was pulled, I did nothing to do with camp anymore. I was pulled directly, like completely away from the day-to-day -day at camp and focused exclusively on COVID and COVID protocols, which I recognize is day-to-day, -day, but a different day-to-day. -day. And what happened, what we failed to do was recognize like that personal nature of camp and how to do that again last summer. And so you people running camps are gonna be pulled in directions you weren't used to. And so you're gonna feel taxed in ways that you haven't been. And I think when we're taxed, it's harder for us to support the counselors who are also being taxed, who are then they're supposed to support the campers who've also been taxed in ways that they've never been before. So when we head into this summer, or as we head into the summer, Camp Centennial specifically, some of the things we've done is um, time management, as simple as that sounds. We are recognizing things we're not gonna do this year because we don't have time and we need time allotted to handle the unknown, but also to handle the things we do know, like people need connection. And so the staff development side this spring, we're bringing all of our university staff back when we normally would early May, but we have no school programs. So what they would normally be doing for a month and a half, we won't be doing. And we'll be focusing almost exclusively on their training, which is certifications, but it's also just the ability for them to connect and get to know me and their supervisors so that when they do feel down, the communication can be productive as opposed to just abrasive. Um, and so I, I really think the vast majority of what I was talking about it being a hard summer Yes, it was also financially hard and all these other things, but I really did mean more emotionally and, and mental well-being. And it's about proactively just remembering what we were already good at and making sure that we take time to do those things. Nothing is new in that sense. 
it's just that it was easy to be distracted away from it, um, in my opinion. Any other questions on that front? One of the questions uh, I got asked, which I thought was funny at the end of last summer, was like, did it work out? <laughs> and um, I'm hesitant to answer the question because there's a couple things. Someone quickly dived into like, well, you know, did you get, did, did COVID spread? Like, did you spread COVID at your camp? Did you have any instance of that? And we didn't. And their follow-up was, okay, cool. So the protocols worked to make sure that COVID didn't spread. And I don't think that's a fair assumption. We didn't have COVID in the province. So we weren't dealing with outbreaks. Um, there were so few cases out East, even to date, that it's, it wasn't handling the pandemic. It was making sure there were protocols in place in case something did happen that maybe we could have handled it. We weren't tested. That doesn't mean we passed the test. Um, and so, yes, I think the protocols were good. That's not to say that it wouldn't have gone well. It's just that we didn't know. When we talk about success for us, um, you know, we had just under 1600 kids come through at a time when most of them hadn't seen their friends. You know, like we had the number of instances where two kids would come in and just start crying and hugging was unbelievable. You know, like this, this emotional impact these young people had. So I think in a lot of ways, there was a lot of success for us. Um, but there were, there were things we didn't do well, which like, obviously, <laughs> um, and there always is in the summer, but I mentioned some of those things that we've missed, that we missed last summer, and, and we're going to feel that impact for the next six years, you know, like the staff culture has shifted, and so that happens every summer, in my opinion, but I think there's going to be things that we're going to be working on forever. Um, our turnaround, like uh, staff turnover, almost for the 30 years that camp has operated, we've seen about a four year average. So you'd see 25% of our staff leave every year. And it was like clockwork. This year we saw almost 50%. And that's unheard of for us. And as we reflect more on it, I really do believe it's, it's on these same things that we talked about. They were more stressed. They didn't get the connection that would normally make them want or need to come back. Um, you know, we almost never have first year staff leave and four or five of them did this year. Um, it was a very different, you know, most of them wouldn't even have known me personally. Like they would have, you know, I'm a face, but they, and that's just not the case in a normal season. So lots of things we succeeded at and lots of things I think we didn't, but overall, I'm certainly very proud of, of what we accomplished. Um, yeah, what else was I? what I would encourage you to take from this. Um, both for your organization and for you as an individual, when you're making decisions um, for operating the summer, deciding what's important and reminding, like writing those things down and having a deep conversation with the people that mean, that have that place in, you, in, in your world and getting that really concrete is important because I think this summer things are going to change a lot, hopefully for the better, but things are going to be constantly changing. And to be reminded of how you want to be making decisions is really relevant. Um, because again, I think the entire rubric that we used to use for, for our contact and our communication shifted last summer. Um, you know, the way we communicated with our camp families was completely unrelated to how we would have done it in the past years. Um, that similar comment I made earlier, approach this the same way you approach the day before COVID. You believed in the value of your program then, you should still believe in it today and, and make sure that that's why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and again, the logistical challenges are significant, um, but they're no longer new. You know, um, whether it's the camping industry or other industries, people have been operating for a year now. So lean into those, find what's relevant for you and, and make it work. Again, that's assuming that the government lets you, lets you do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I had some questions. 
um, asked if you guys want to chat about it or if you'd like me just to stop talking, that's great too. Let me know what, what are people thinking? Can I ask a question? Were they flexible in your province about um, camps that ran differently than yours? Um, uh, like I understand being cohorted like that, but what about camps that run six weeks or seven weeks or five weeks? Were, were those camps running the same way as you the whole time? So um, the point, the, the, the comment I made about staffing, that's a camp centennial specifically, that was not a requirement from the province of like how we, like our philosophy towards staffing. The idea of 15 camper bubbles, those like cohorts, whatever you want to call it, that was a protocol by the province. Um, and so that was non-negotiable. The province was not, I should be careful how I answer this. The province was not open to um, specific situations. So, you know, if we approached and said, well, we do it this way, can we have an exemption? There was no exemptions at this time. This was a time when, you know, businesses weren't running, you know, essential services were running and that was it. New Brunswick now, I'm not sure what that culture would be like. The only time we got to make impact on those protocols I'll say was through that like relationship with the health authority as they released and were looking for review. So I realized that's like a fine line difference, but it wasn't an exemption. It was a conversation about the actual protocol, but there was only one protocol that changed constantly, but there was only one protocol. <laughs> Does that make sense? Does that answer what you're looking for? I mean, yeah, it makes sense. It's just too bad that one protocol for all camps when everybody's different, it seems sad. Oh, yeah. and, and largely non-logical. You know, there wasn't, it, it, I think the protocols we got to were okay. But like I said about that little piece about staff, like, you know, by the end of the summer, bars were open and yet we were still operating in, in, in very strict protocols. So um, yeah, there was certainly lots of opportunity for frustration there. Uh, John, can I just ask a practical question from you? Um, what would y'all's, policy or plan if a staff member or camper got sick and kind of what was your what had to be your response to that and and thank you for coming on it's been great to hear you talk <laughs> yeah happy to chat um so again that's something that shifted drastically from our pre-camp camp to the end of the summer at pre-camp camp opening picture this if two people showed one symptom of covid the health authority would shut us down Two people showed one symptom. We're talking itchy throat, sneezing, headaches. You know, that was the original protocol they released to us. And so the what they told us what, at the beginning was when someone shows a symptom, you take them to an isolated area. So we've got a bedroom we cleared out and um, basically they'd be brought home and tested. Um, and if there was two of these, then your program was shut down until they got the test results back. That changed pretty quickly in the sense that it became two people with two symptoms or one person who was tested positive. So that's the protocol side. Camp Centennial's approach was if anyone was showing symptoms at any time, you isolate them from the group and you get them home basically, and you ask that they get tested. Luckily, everyone we dealt with always was open to getting tested. Um, and we never had anyone come back with a positive result. Um, but again, that point of like, you know, a counselor having a headache and sending them home is wild in any other season. But that's what we, that is what we did. We were again, wildly overstaffed. In the protocols, we were allowed those like cohorts. If a counselor had to leave, you could add a counselor. You could actually add as many counselors as you wanted. There's no limits on that. But once they were in that cohort, they had to stay in that cohort for the week. So you couldn't have basically like substitute counselors coming and going. Once they were in, they had to stay. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Any other questions, comments? I guess I can stop sharing my screen. What were you guys looking at that whole time? <laughs> It was just the final, final slide. Oh, okay, good. Awesome. Well, again, if there's, oh, was there a hand raise there? Yeah, did you, um, did you find that your staff, like what was the, 
the you being kind of a, a an upper level staff member what was the feeling with like your your baseline staff of like their comfort level with coming forward with you know i woke up and my throat was sore yeah um, so again like the information being moved around freely or yeah so it was interesting that i'll say in a normal season and i should be careful admitting this when someone calls in sick for me i'm always a little like yeah like you can't come in really like you got a sore throat like that's why you can't come in and it was interesting to see a, a massive shift in that so last year counselors would say you know, like you know yeah i've got a sore throat but i'm fine and it's like no you're going home like that's the like there's no gray area here so i would say that their average comfort level to come to us was fairly high the conversation was very open around COVID at the time. I don't think there was a lot of like judgment on that in our, in our crew. There certainly wasn't necessarily like, you know, in the news or whatnot, but I don't think in staff, the issue that I perceived at least, and I could be wrong on this was that it didn't come to mind, you know, like, yeah, you wake up with a headache. They weren't really thinking that that could be COVID. Um, and really, like even that idea that the term was like new onset of symptoms. So people that had reoccurring, you know, all their life headaches, that was really hard to try and figure out where we were going to operate on those questions. And one of the things, the benefit we had last summer that we're not going to have this summer, when we opened, we could do no wrong. The staff and parents supported us like I've never seen. They were thrilled. The hoops we made them jump through would normally make people probably cancel their registration. But last year it was magic, you know, like they were all just happy and appreciative. That's not going to be the attitude this year. People will have levels of entitlement like we always do. Um, so I think there'll be different challenges there. Um, there was a couple of interesting conversations with staff about paid sick leave because that got into the news and then they felt entitled to these concepts too. So that was kind of a funny like walk the line as well, you know, things that just would never have normally been a concern. Any other questions, comments? I assume Manitoba is still waiting to hear what their summer looks like. Yeah, we were pretty much in a good plan or a good place of um, our public health and government um, were thinking that they were gonna say yes. And that's basically the message that we had received um, at the end of the week last week, but with the variants here are now starting to come up quite a bit. So they've had to pause and they can't give us an answer. We're just gonna be in a waiting game now that, yeah. So hopefully it won't get that bad and we will be able to, but yeah, we're waiting. And I'm my guess is that the majority of provinces are gonna be there right now with lockdown starting to happen again. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, the unofficial official word I've got from, I'll say this contact that isn't political and isn't in it is that there's no appetite in New Brunswick to plan ahead. Oh, and like, okay. you know, to hear this from a province who operated last summer and now they're saying like, you're going to find out like everyone else, you know, and, and, and no want to have a conversation about, yeah, it is infuriating. <laughs> and, you know, her even saying like, this is ridiculous, but it is the official directive from the top down. So um we are optimistic and we are red you know, our restorations full and all that stuff but um yeah we're hopeful similar to you guys we're all figuring it out <laughs> yeah are there any other questions for john for anybody about what he's talked about or something you can relate back to you at camp right now it is a quiet bunch today john you're right yeah so much information if there is anything I can do, um, you're welcome to get my contact information from Kim. Um, I am very, very dedicated to helping camps run if it's at all possible. So if there's anything I can do, please feel free to reach out. Our operational plan is on our website, campsustainable.ca. So you're welcome to look at that if that's of help. Um, yeah, thanks so much for chatting. Awesome. Thank you so much, John, for being here today. It was good to have you share um, how you succeeded last year. And to me, yeah, it is a success. You were able to run um, with all those stressors and everything that, that were there. So here's hoping that you'll get the okay sign again this year too, that, that you'll be able to make that happen. So on behalf of all of us, thank you. You're very welcome. Take care, folks. Thanks.